everybody knows Jason Grout very active in the project, and he's uh, enlisted his baby brother, Ryan Grout, and I was quizzing them on the family situation. Ten, ten years difference, uh, two of eight children in their family. Jason's number two and you're number six. Got that right. So they went looking for some family photos. And I guess three families family. or something. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. And siblings. Some branch. I see Jason. Where are you at? Right in the back. Yeah, right yeah. in the back. Yeah. All right. So family photos. Uh, Ryan is involved with the Linear Algebra Lab Manual Project at Brigham Young University. So we've slotted him in the schedule to give us a taste of what's going on there since uh, that's sort of something this audience should be interested in. And just press, press command Q. Uh, skip. Sorry. of developing a new curriculum for applied math and our computations major at BYU. Um, and this is specifically focusing on interdisciplinary applications of mathematics. So how math ties a lot of different fields together. And it's kind of like the common, I guess, area for a lot of fields. Um, this is designed to be a two year, four semester program and the writing for textbooks and for lab manuals for this. Um, <clears throat> and it's inspired by a program that uh, is at BYU, a mentoring program for undergraduates. And that program was funded by NSF grants, as is, I think, this uh, new curriculum development. And those are the grant numbers for reference. Um, so in the major, um, we at least have a math minor, um, and these classes as prereqs. And then you end up studying these, and then picking an area of emphasis in one of those areas. Um, it could be a major in that area, and a minor in math, or it could be a major in math, and a minor in one of those areas. Um, Okay, so the current status. Um, <clears throat> textbooks are being written by one of my professors, Dr. Jeff Humphreys. And the textbooks mainly cover the theoretical aspects of this program. And then the lab manuals are being written by a group of students. Um, I'm one of those students that's uh, looking over and revising these manuals. And these lab manuals contain the practical applications of the topics discussed in the textbooks. And originally, the whole project was planned to be done in MATLAB. And they got to the draft for the second volume, and they realized that some of the things they wanted to do couldn't be done in MATLAB. And so they started looking around, and they eventually fell in love with Python. Yes? Can I ask if couldn't meant not without buying the symbolic toolbox, or literally couldn't? I mean, I'm just curious couldn't if that means very interesting. Because they needed a more general programming language. They wanted to do, like, you know, data structures uh, and trees uh, and such. Not and a real programming that, language. <laughs> interesting. Can't do that. So huh. they fell in love with Python. And interesting. so since the beginning of this year, We've been translating all the first lab manual from MATLAB into a comparable Python version. Using, for now, specifically SciPy and Matplotlib. Um, however, everything that we're doing in these lab manuals can be done in Sage after importing SciPy and Matplotlib libraries. 
Um, okay, so how does it relate to CH? We already have a preview of that. Um, so the labs are now implemented in Python, which um, kind of reduces the entry barrier for uses for Sage, um, because Sage uses Python. Um, so now the rest of the course, the entire course now is based on Python instead of MATLAB. Uh, the first volume will be written in both Python and MATLAB kind of as an introduction thing, but it's really stressing the Python part of it. So this course is to convert people from MATLAB. <laughs> it could be thought of that way, yes. Um, okay, so Python plus IPy and other goodies is what makes up Sage, and so the labs that we're writing naturally can translate into Sage worksheets, and it actually can do that really nicely. Um, I was really interested in Rob Beezer's work on converting LaTeX files to Sage worksheets because I think that would really, really um, help out in this project as well. It would really be worthwhile to, to look at. Um, and then we're also using Sage Tech to format the code samples in the lab manuals. Um, so we input you know, the Python code. And then instead of just copying and pasting the output, we're trying to use Sage Tech to automatically like evaluate it and put it into the lab manager for us. Um, and so the announcement is, uh, about a month ago we decided to open source these lab manuals. So people, anybody could work on them. Um, so they're gonna be open source. And we're hoping that by open sourcing them, um, we'll be able to receive contributions from experts in their field of expertise. So, for instance, in chemistry, um, we could have you know, maybe a lab dealing with the mathematical side of chemistry and kind of apply that connection there. Um, and we're hoping that this will make the labs more relevant and interesting for the students. Um, and the labs would be up to date and reviewed as well. And the labs are designed to be independent from the textbook. So if you decide to use the labs, you don't have to worry about you know, having to buy a textbook or anything with it. Um, and so the current plans right now, as far as open sourcing it, is to use GitHub to kind of coordinate everything. And we haven't determined a license just yet. We're still considering a couple things. And I think our latest consideration was the Creative Commons license. Um, and so we're kind of actually looking for people that help us you know, figure out how to, the best way to get this out into the public open source area. And I emailed my professor last night, and he wrote back this quote that I thought would be interesting to all of you. Um, he said, I think that we should also have a pure stage version at some point. Um, so that's kind of part of taking these labs and making them available as stage worksheets, and they'd be really interactive then. Um, okay, so there's our contact information, Dr. Humphreys, Brian. And then impact is kind of what this whole program is based off of, um, or inspired by. It's the undergraduate mentoring program. So let's actually take a look at some labs. Um, I've selected a few of the labs from our lab manual. Uh, the labs covering QRD composition, numerical derivatives, Brodian's method, Julia sets, and Markov chains. Yeah. Um, okay. That's it. Thank you. Here's the actual lab manuals that we've been working on. Um, 
We have the MATLAB edition. Can you click the green button so that it... The end button. The full screen. I don't know. It's hard to see. It seems yeah, like green button in the upper left. Yeah. Green button in the upper left. Or drag it over. I'm not, I'm not a... Yeah, tap, your, tap your fingers like this. Whoa, not that. Yeah. <laughs> I think you have to drag the title over, then reveal the green button, then click it. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There we are. <laughs> cool. Yeah. Okay. So the lab manuals deal with applied mathematics and computing. This is the MATLAB edition. These are the labs over here. And this is the Python edition. So, um, the first couple labs deal with just introduction to Python, learning how to work Python and get results. And then we're going to look at QR decomposition. The labs are laid out with a lesson objective. Um, and then uh, the way it's laid out, you're already expected to know like the things that are covered in the lab. So you're expected to know what the gram schmidt process is, what the QR decomposition is. And this lab focuses on how do you write a program that will calculate the QR decomposition. Um, so there's a review of the gram schmidt process. Have a little bit of code there. Go into squares and then talking about um, numerical stability of the gram schmidt process and how to make it more stable. And then the actual code that the student is expected to write is not that, but Here's the actual code to calculate the QR decomposition um, from scratch, you could say. And then from sci-fi. You notice that this is just reversed by negative one. But yeah. But they're the same matrices. So just an example of the type of labs you're expected to do and the type of things that the labs will have them do. Um, let's see. Are there any questions? So they're doing this all in Python and not really using Sage at all, right? At this point, at this point, they're doing it in Python, um, and we'd like to get to the point where these would also be Sage worksheets. So yeah, yeah. A, and a follow-up question. Yeah. So one thing I've used MATLAB in a past life mm -hmm. at some point, and you can deal with rather large files like uh, singular value decomposition. You use and look at image storage and so on, which mm -hmm. is probably not the best way to do image storage. But um, how, and, and it's fairly reason, fairly optimized. Mm -hmm. How optimized is the, uh, the Python code? Um, Python's pretty good. Python's pretty, the same, pretty, pretty, pretty good. Pretty good. Same. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Yeah. SciPy is meant okay. to be done. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, it's it's, it's kind of serious. I'd say it's just, you can implement, say, computing a reduced echelon form of a matrix in pure Python, 
but it's insanely fast. But it's the, really the point here is that we both call the same underlying yeah. Lapac libraries. But, but yeah. it's not just that. I mean, they really optimize a lot of every vectorized operation you can think of, and a lot of it has nothing to do with the Lapac. It's just they really, really optimize the implementation. Plus, if you want it to be even faster, you can use Cython to directly access all of the NumPy in a very natural way, all the early NumPy data structures, and very, very fast. It's really impressive. Yeah, as a caveat, MATLAB interfaces with a lot more of the patent than SciPy does. And so, I mean, there's open, low hanging. I think I do that at one time. There's, there's low hanging fruit there to, to, to use the pack routines that like deal with tridiagonal matrices that SciPy does not, you know, just wrap yet. But, uh, that doesn't hang quite that well. Yeah, my guess is for any undergraduate stuff, you know, they're going to be completely comparable as far as speed and how long they're So as, as far as like the linear algebra part of this, like these labs rely very heavily on the sci-fi libraries to provide a lot of the optimized functions for that. Yes. But, but when we do this in our class, like we can just ask our students, you know, here's the lab manual and, you know, do this in a Sage worksheet and share that Sage worksheet with me. Yeah. So, like everything that we're asking students to do in these labs can be done in the Sage Workshop. And that's kind of the vision right now. Um, I'd like to actually translate a couple of these labs into Sage Worksheets, or convert a couple of these labs into Sage Worksheets just to see how it's going to work. Um, that's part of my project for today to work on that. Yes? It kind of looks like this is uh, an intro to programming over. Is, is this, it would, would the focus change for Sage interaction? Or, because Sage has a lot of this stuff built in, it's got a lot of features in it, but uh, you're having students write in Python the, the, base, the base functions yeah. that would already have been implemented. So right now, we're dealing mostly with pure Python and SciPy. Um, but when we do make the transition to a Sage worksheet, we could probably cut out a lot of, a lot of like, the programming intricacies of it. So I guess the, the, the purpose of this of these labs is not to introduce them to a language that's just a side effect of Exactly. They, exactly. So I mean we spend the first couple labs talking about you know how Python works, how how they do things in Python. But then then the whole rest of the lab manual is about the applications of mathematics and then you kind of pick up Python along the way as you have more experience with it, more exposure to it. Yes? Isn't there a pedagogical I mean, reason to ask the students to implement things? Like, who understands, you may or may not understand the QR decomposition, but if a student can program the QR decomposition, like, they have to really understand it well in order to program it. So it's, it's also sort of seeking in the, the mathematical concepts to ask them to actually program it. Yeah, I guess these are upper level right. students. And there's, and there's two ways to do it. One that's kind of naive and not very stable, and one that's not a whole lot harder to code. Like that. Yeah. That, that is much stable. So you can make that so point. In, in some of the labs, we have them at first implement like the unstable method, and then talk about the instabilities, and then have them you know, revise the methods throughout the lab to a more stable version. And so they understand, you know, like here's the way you could do it, but it's not that great. And then read about all the ways that it could be improved. And then at the end, to have a finished, well, not finished, but you know, have a, a good, stable implementation of, of whatever you're studying at that point. Um, and a lot of these programs aren't terribly difficult or terribly long. Um, if you understand the math behind it, they're not. If you understand the math behind it really well, you shouldn't have a lot of trouble writing the program. So, um, let's see, I think, okay. So one of the other things that we're doing was the uh, lab on Julia sets. And understanding basins of attraction. Scroll through the lab here. And then you have different problems in the lab. Some will have you explain, like write explanations for things. Some will have you like write a function. 
to calculate a result, and other labs will have you, or problems will have you um, like write a function and then write a different function to double check the one you just wrote. Type of thing. Um, so for this lab, uh, we had to use matplotlib and interesting way. Um, so this was done in MATLAB, that graphic. And the student I was working with said it'd be really cool if we could like zoom in on that. So spent a little bit of time. And Matplot website is excellent. This is actually a tweaked example from the Matplot website that allows you to interact with the plot. So you can zoom in, and it's supposed to recalculate at every zoom. There we are. So as you zoom in, it'll recalculate the plot. And how do you get that interactive? Because like, that's what we really want in Sage to some extent. Like we want people okay. to do it. Is that the, is there any easy way for us to get that into the notebook, <coughs> or is that going to be pretty? Uh, I'll show you the source code too, real quick. Tricky. It's not terribly difficult, but it did require some knowledge of that plot. Right? Here's the source to that. Um, so is the X update for the whatever? Yeah, there's some, something yeah. JavaScript that's happening, right? Or this is not in the notebook. This is not JavaScript. This is all this is client is, application yeah. using uh, PK on the local computer. Yeah. Because they have any somewhere we can do that zooming and then we can we, that would be a we want. So this is what the HTML5 backend is about okay. for Matplotlib to make that yeah. happen in JavaScript. Well, I did not know that, but yeah, that'd be really cool if we could get like zoom little plots or, or interactive plots on that stage. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so essentially basically what it's doing is every time you zoom in, it recalls this function which calculates the new Julia set based on the arguments of the zoom window that you have specified. Um, Okay, so as far as open sourcing, not all the labs are completed yet. So some of the labs are actually just outlines right now. But still, this is a massive amount of work you guys have done. Okay, so the labs are already there. Yeah, so when we open source it, like we just don't want to tell people, hey, write a lab on the perspective transform. Like we want to be able to at least provide an outline of the content that we want the lab to you know, cover. Another thing with the lab being open source, that means teachers, any of you, um, are free to use it for like their classes or to tweak it however you need to. Um, and then maybe contribute changes back to the lab manual and make it in there. Um, so that's what we're really excited about open source being able to harness that contribution or contributing power of a community that has a vested interest in these labs. And if there's no more questions, I think I'm done. Yes. Is it, maybe you put this already up already. Is there a link to these labs? Are they on the internet now? or Not yet. That's why I wanted to do it today. Actually, okay. I got the go-ahead from my professor to host these on GitHub today. But you haven't decided on a license. We haven't determined the license that we're going to be released under. Can you post yeah. the link on the wiki or someplace? Yeah. Once, and, and yeah. Once you get it. So <coughs> my hope is to have to start something today to host a couple of these labs and then to finish it through the coming week and have them pretty much all hosted by the end of next week. 
Yes. So, I mean, with any open source project, you put it out there, but of course you can't, you know, demand everybody, you know, spend all the time to do your project type of thing. Um, however, you're probably going to get a lot of contributions and stuff like that, and a lot of forks on GitHub, etc., changing things. How much? How much are you guys invested in like curating this and pulling it together? You know, really nice labs based on the contributions you might get. Uh, As you mean like like managing an open source project? Yeah, exactly. How? Like, are you just putting out this out there and forgetting about it, or are you putting this out there and continually updating it, improving it, and revising it, et cetera? Are you we, playing an we, active role? We want to we want to put it out there and then kind of like I'm not sure what the word is, but like oversee the organization of it as well. So okay. we'll, we'll continue having a role in the lab okay. Um And yeah, so that's kind of what I want to do today is figure out how it's going to be organized and just get something done on it. Yes. Um, are you planning on, uh, well, I, I, when you, when you, sorry, before we have the question, um, when you, Bring this to the students. Uh, I, I, I'd obviously, at that point, you're not you're expecting it to not be edited anymore. You could have put kill switches on certain, like once a once the lab is done, are you going to say this lab should not be edited anymore? Are you going to lock that stuff down? Or, or um, the idea is to always have the labs continuously updated because we don't want labs going out of date or you know like losing relevance to a specific field. So the idea is to to. have, yeah, continuously updated labs so they're always relevant and current. But, but you can so, freeze a version at the beginning yeah. of the semester and say, this yeah, version number is, you know, the lab that will be for the class of the semester. Yeah. So, yeah, probably, probably at that point, we'd only accept minor edits, typographical edits, but you can keep accepting whatever edits. You can just say, for this class, you know, tag your Git repository. With, you know, this is fall 2011. This is sort of where we're at. You know, this is what's printed for the fall 2011 course. And no, you I can see. continue updating. It. I mean, this is like releasing a stable version and keeping development going on the tree. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then also releasing like Sage worksheets as we complete them on the GitHub as well. So I think, I think you'll find my experience with my book and helping Tom with his book. You will get lots of typos and those kind of corrections, and I think it will. I think that leads to really high quality stuff eventually. And I'm surprised at the typos that people find in my books. Yeah. My book, six or seven letters. I kidded Tom a little bit. He got a missing comma turned in one time, which never happened when it was commercialized. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I figure if they're getting comma. down to missing commas, then yeah. I'm pretty getting pretty good about the errors. Yeah. <laughs> but did they, but did they first submit a ticket? Did they get reviewed? <laughs> no, but, we, but, but we've both been sent patches mm -hmm. oh, to, wow. to our source. Mm -hmm. Mint, people, people know Mint. The first first patch I got was like 120 spelling corrections. <laughs> <laughs> a single patch. <laughs> My experience, the quality of the typo fixes were much better than commercial publishers also. Really? Strangely enough, yeah. Professional editors. Like, do your books Some of them are terrible. What? They don't understand mathematics. Yes, right. just right. professional right. editors. Right. Like, one of them had me delete all punctuation from formulas that were displayed. <laughs> Even though the standard mathematical convention right. is to include them. Right. Like, tons of stuff right. like that. I just had to rebel against Springer's editor. <laughs> it's bizarre. It's Springer, you'd think, you'd think, you'd think. Yeah. yeah, the other thing I found about that is that if I get an error now, I correct it as, as soon as I get it. It yeah. just, um, we're using Mercurial to keep it. Uh, oh updated and, and usually uh, I update everything just after one fix so yeah uh, so you have a continually revised version of the book on you don't freeze a version of the book on the site and say this is well we freeze it on the site but like on, a on, not on the repository have, in, in, oh, in Bitbucket right. it's just evolving oh okay so if we go to the Bitbucket site we've been making PDF snapshots when, when there's been sort of a, a big set of changes or it's right. been a few months or right before right. spring semester but what we've done is we have an annual edition so in okay. August there's sort of an official PDF or whatever and a tag in the repository like you were talking about right. and that's sort of what we think is in good shape for that coming right. academic year. In August, uh, it seems really close to the semester for 
bookstores or whatever people would. Well, that's the PDF and that's the source. You know, the, the, the guys, so it's an interesting story. The, the hardback version of Tom's book is some guys at Virginia Commonwealth who, who did not ask permission and did not have to. They just grabbed the source, paid for a commercial font, printed it, cleaned it up, inserted it, and print on demand. Uh, it shows up in Amazon. You know, and, and people think that they're like treading on Tom's rights or something like that. But I walked into class and said, if you want the hard, hard it's hardback. If you want the hardback, the 400 page hardback book, just go to Amazon. And, you know, I ordered my copy on a Wednesday and it came on Monday. Yeah. Okay. You know, I think the, like, that book is like $50, though, the Sage, the Crate one. Right. Kind of. Yeah. Somebody's making a lot of money on that because it's oh, yeah. it costs like 15 dollars for print on demand for something that size. Probably cost about 10. Yeah. That. I mean, that's like if, if we made that kind of thing and then under an open license and put it up for print, it would be 10 or 15 bucks instead of $50. Okay. Your book, right? Your yeah, for example. Book. Well, <laughs> my entire is definitely a different audience than that book. Uh, right, sure. That one's less yeah. theory, more results. Right. Mine's very program oriented. All right, any other questions or discussion for Ryan? So one last plea is if anybody has any experience with open sourcing a textbook or using GitHub, I would like to talk <laughs> to you after this. So I posted my book on Google Code uh, two hours ago. So that's my experience so far with the book. <laughs> <laughs> Have you got your first typo yet? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. I'm downloading it right now. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Right. Yeah, big hand on the 11, and I, Michael, Tom, and myself are going to make coffee runs, so whenever we get back to coffee. <laughs>